So, uh, okay, yeah. Um, now, uh, again, this is Yahweh Yeh with the National Mirror's Office, and um, he has uh, several uh, great topics that he can probably cover with us today. Yahweh, uh, we have a few that are curious about the uh, initiative to get uh, Google Fiber in the Nashville area. If you could talk about that, I don't know if that's uh, public information that you're able to disclose, but um, also, obviously, um, we'd like to hear where we went with the Nashville or the multi-city innovation campaign that you previewed with us in uh, February and March of this year in this in our user group meeting. So uh, I'll hand it over to you and go ahead and you've got the reins. Sure. Uh, hey everyone, it's nice to join in. Um, I mean, I live in Nashville, but just happen to be in California right now. But it's uh, it's really awesome that you're all uh, getting together. Um, I, I can start off actually with Google Fiber and give you an update on where we are uh, amongst the 34 cities that Google Fiber is looking at. Um, the first is that uh, the city uh, delivered all the information that was requested by the company. Um, it was a long list. Uh, there were a lot of departments that were involved. Uh, there are a lot of spreadsheets, um, data sets, uh, narrative metadata <laughs> that we all submitted, and uh, we met the deadline. Uh, we made a point of it to turn it in a day early just in case something went south. Um, so uh, on that front, um, we checked a big box off. Um, since then, the next steps that Google Fiber said that they really needed to do was sit down with uh, Nashville Electric Service. Um, I think you all know, um, for those that live in Davidson County or work in Davidson County, that you see the, uh, you know, we have a public power, public electric utility, and that's actually of interest to, to Google. And um, part of what they need to figure out is uh, a poll attachment process. Um, and, you know, actually, just I'm curious, if I show my hands, how many of you already are familiar with the NES Dark Fiber Network in Davidson County? Um, I, I, so a couple hands went up, but uh, for those of you who didn't raise your hands, um, if you didn't know already, actually NES has a fiber network um, that's commercially available today that's built out to the same specs as Google Fiber, and we have about 150 miles of it that's uh, available throughout Davidson County. It's primarily concentrated in the commercial areas of our county, so a lot downtown, and there's really not as much... Um, penetration in the residential area. So uh, in that sense, um, Google's real interested in just the build-out process that uh, NES did. Um, you know, for understandable reasons, um, I'm new still to Nashville, and I'm learning about limestone. And to know that, you know, when you go underground, it's not easy to bore through limestone. And if you talk fiber systems, um, you know, you're either aerial or you're um, below ground. And uh, below ground is something that NES is really solved by doing most of its fiber network um, above ground and using its poles. And so Google Fiber in particular is interested in the massive network of poles. We have about 400,000 poles in the NES network. Um, so being able to know what the permitting process is like to access it, um, knowing what the uh, kind of design process is like, um, they call it the make, make ready process for uh, NES poles. And those are the kind of details now that uh, Google Fiber um, as a team is looking at all these different markets to then see if uh, it makes sense for them to partner with these entities. So timing-wise, you know, they, they're still holding to they won't announce any market before the end of this calendar year. Um, they're actually on-site. Uh, today's Wednesday. They're on-site tomorrow with the NES team to continue discussions uh, around polls. Um, and then they're going to come back at the end of July to uh, review the permitting process with our codes department and all of our metro departments. Um, you know, it's, it's, uh, it's been eye-opening working with a company like Google and then a, a team within Google like Google Fiber um, because they, they definitely move quickly. At the same time, we're learning that they do have their own internal process. Um, an example, um, you know, if they uh, need to make a final decision by Friday, then they need to have all the information from us by a Tuesday or a Monday. Um, so, you know, we're learning to work with a company like Google um, while they're also learning to work with us. Um, but the, the best thing that we can do as government from our office's perspective, um, from within the mayor's office, um, is to be as efficiently responsive as possible. Awesome. Um, I know that's kind of the, 
what I got on Google Fiber. I don't know if there's any other specific questions or anything else before. Does anybody here have any questions they'd like to ask to, to Yahweh about the, uh, the Google Fiber? Is there any possibility they're looking at extending beyond what NES has already built? Absolutely. Actually, uh, so since NES is built up primarily to the commercial districts, NES strategically has said they have no interest in building out to the residential space. Google Fiber is, at this point, exclusively a residential play. So if you kind of see it as like two pieces of the puzzle coming together, uh, they would just be most interested in using the NES polls, that they would be delivering service to a market that's not served at all by NES at this point. Anybody? What's the projected timeline that they'll make a decision? Um, we'd love to know exactly if there's a, a date. <laughs> you know, it's um, the company understandably is holding that really close, and the only the only uh, update is that they will not announce anything before the end of this calendar year. Um, so we're holding to that. You know, if we know any more information, um, we're government, so we want to be be as transparent as possible. What what do they estimate the deployment time is once they decide? Uh, we, could you say one? So, what's the estimated the deployment time? Does it take to build out once they decide to go for it? Yeah. Uh, so, actually, two week two weeks ago, Google Fiber sponsored a conference in Kansas City, Missouri. You know, where they built out their first net network, and about eight utilities from around the country convened. Um, I tagged along with their National Electric Service Group, and you know, they shared that they wouldn't start any build out until 2015 at the earliest. Um, they also shared that you know they they have uh, concerns about um, how they roll out. You know, they, when we when we were talking about the Kansas City Power and Light, and it's a private utility. They shared that um, at some points they ran into the issue of building contractors not always having the right number of employees to actually go out and build at the scale that Google Fiber wants to build at. Um, and because of it, they pulled a lot of talent in from around the country to Kansas City. And so, uh, the, you know, uh, it made a lot of sense in that uh, all the, the other utilities were saying, well, if you announce something, you know, at the end of this year, how are you going to manage the build-out in multiple markets at once? Um, and so uh, there's, I understand that there are some teams within Google Fiber that are looking at that issue and trying to figure out uh, how they can ramp up the talent that's available for both the kind of certified positions so the employees that ultimately have to work with live wires, for example, and then those that maybe they don't have to be sort of they don't have to be receive any certification, uh, like uh, digging trenches, you know, helping to uh, physically move earth or you know do other things that aren't, aren't um, uh, you know aren't as process intensive for training people. Um, there were some lessons learned for build out in Kansas City. There essentially is a crew from the city that follows around the contractors, because uh, for some of the non-certified positions, uh, there was a subcontractor that was digging severed a, a, a power line, a, a subterranean power line, and then try to use rubber cement to actually glue it back together, <laughs> uh, which was just a disaster. <laughs> and they, you know, KCPNL was on it. They caught him and they immediately fired that subcontractor and. It's the kind of thing where building out to that scale is something um, very few, if any, utilities have done. Um, kind of a, a thumb, a rule of thumb for us internally. What NES has built out maybe in a year, or in terms of number of poles that they touch, um, if Google Fiber were to select Nashville, they could touch that within one month. So the scale is just massive compared to um, typical operations. Looks like that's all of our questions, I guess. Uh, if uh, you're comfortable, then uh, what would you like to tell us about the Nashville or the, the multi-city innovation campaign? Sure. Uh, first, I'm going to say hey to Brian, because I see Brian. Um, and <laughs> and I, just to, to let folks know that um, we were fortunate that um, we had a, a, a whole group of talented developers submit ideas to um, the four cities that work together, and uh, so I don't repeat. Actually, did did every is everyone already familiar with the background of the multi-city, or is that helpful to provide? It wouldn't hurt. I would say go ahead and, and if you can give a minute and a half of review of it. Sure. So uh, basically, um, four cities 
Palo Alto, kind of going across west to east, Palo Alto, Nashville, Boston, and Raleigh, uh, we'd all held kind of and participated in hackathons, and we saw some really great uh, civic-focused prototypes developed that, you know, just um, didn't have a sustainability plan. It didn't have a way forward after the hackathon. And we were all scared, frankly, as cities, to just think that developers would ultimately get tired of working with us. Um, and the, lo the losers, in that sense, then, um, are the communities, because the cool prototypes then don't get a chance to see light of day and actually get rolled out in the community. Um, and so we banded together and we said, how do we um, help out on two fronts, the sustainability uh, and scalability of uh, mobile apps? Um, so all four of us, um, in terms of scalability, said if we can get in on the design end with a software developer and talk through a shared problem, it would be great for us to then agree that we would roll out a prototype that's demonstrated and kind of fully baked um, across all four of our cities simultaneously um, and help out with that scalability. For the sustainability part of it, we all said we, while we all believe in open source approach, we also knew that there would be, uh, you know, a new option if we could help provide some seed money. So essentially, positioning cities as angel investors. So we all agreed to put up five thousand um, dollars to create a pool of twenty thousand um, dollars, and we ran this campaign, the innovation campaign, over the last kind of four or five months, asked for the uh, ideas from developers across all the different markets. Um, we got about twenty-five different ideas submitted. Um, we picked six finalists. Um, Brian and his team were uh, finalists, and uh, we um, actually benefited then across the four cities um, by having a demo video that was um, kind of broadcast on our website uh, as part of the National Day of Civic Hacking. So the White House, uh, this, this is the second year, is sponsored our National Day of Civic Hacking on May 31st and June 1st. And we put together uh, you know, a kind of chunk of time with the Nashville and then the other cities to be able to review all the demos and talk with the developers across all, all of our markets. Um, Boston, uh, there, was a, there was a glitch. Boston was able to join, but the three, three out of the four cities talked. All of us did get a chance to review. And um, kind of two first team, there are two teams that tied for first place. And we did a tiebreaker vote. And the ultimate winner of it was um, Actually, based in Palo Alto, uh, it is uh, an ADA. It's called Enabled City, and it's an ADA compliance kind of tool where it's built on a Yelp platform, and you crowdsource information by essentially using um, your mobile phone to measure the width of a doorway or the height of a counter that you can then can submit to, um, you know, uh, store it in the cloud, and in that sense, help people who do think and deal with ADA um, issues on a day-to-day -day basis to have more information. So if like, you're going to a restaurant on Yelp, you'll see that, oh, there's no ramp. You know, that's not cool. I'm not, that, that I'm not going to patronize that, that um, restaurant. Um, at the same time, there's some useful, uh, that's a useful resource for government, because then we can go out and you know, bring our hammer <laughs> and just say, you're not, you're not up to code, you got to comply with ADA, you, you can't do this, and um, be able to follow up. Um, the other team uh, uh, that had kind of tied for first was an indoor wayfinding app. So it was using a, a beacon technology, uh, so Bluetooth Low Energy, and they had used um, the Music City Center as a kind of laboratory for what they were trying out. Um, and basically, it's, you know, by show of hands, have all you been in the new Music City Center? It's massive. It's it's three blocks long. People are getting lost. Um, I think I shared with you at that point. My joke was, it's they're like Harry Potter half floors, and you know it's kind of confusing. If if you have to go to M, and you don't know, you weren't boring though, knowing that M was above or below the whole number, <laughs> so it's just hard to to find it. Um, and this app would allow uh, people to navigate um, essentially from point A to point B, um, but functioning just like you would outdoors, but now using Bluetooth technology to direct you indoors. Um, and so the, the potential is there for um, you know, a really interesting kind of communications platform 
for uh, like advertisers like Tootsie's to push out information to conventioners to say, hey, look, you get 50% coupon, and you can go out to Broadway and then get a good deal. Um, the other one I do want to plug is Bryant, uh, which is called Taxi Dash. Uh, I think you all know in Nashville we've got um, Uber and Lyft or, and UberX and all these different vehicles, and there's some cities that have really uh, just reacted um, aggressively against these uh, ride-sharing um, businesses. And in Nashville, we have a taxi commissioner who said, we can't do that. We actually have to embrace them, but learn from it. And so um, Brian and his team developed uh, a prototype that would allow people to, just like on UberX and Lyft, rate taxi drivers and the quality of experience that they had with uh, the taxi drivers that are commissioned and uh, medallioned to work with uh, Metro government. Um, at the same time, there's also a fair estimator um, which is a really cool feature because, you know, I think there's always a sense that you're sketched out and you're saying, I am taking way too many turns and this doesn't feel right and I just think that there's more mileage being added to my fare. Um, this estimator, you know, will ideally help people understand on the front end that they don't have to feel that way. They have at least a, a range to understand um, how much they should be paying. Um, and it, the underlying technology, Brian, I'm going to totally mess it up and so it's good that you're there to clear of my errors, but it, it um, would also potentially rely on a Bluetooth low energy uh, beacon device to help push out information. Um, and in that sense, uh, this is where government comes in and where it's a little different from UberX and Lyft. We care about public safety. Um, Nashville's a, it's a safe big city, but I don't know if you all remember last year there was a, a woman who uh, was murdered um, and believed to have gotten into a gypsy taxi, and it's still an open case. Um, and so our police chief was really intrigued by the idea of creating a digital trail um, for people who opt into it, who choose into using that app, to then give a clear signal that, you know, you, driver, or you, the world, know that me has, you know, I've gotten into the taxi at this point um, in this location. And so in that sense, it's really appealing from a public safety perspective. Um, so it's it's really great. And, you know, what we've learned from the multi-city one is in spite of just having one kind of um, app that we're all four of us are working with, we're each trying to pursue the ideas that were laid out by the different developers so we can continue the whole idea of city as laboratory and pushing out data that's relevant to building apps um, and then ideally scaling um, and supporting apps that can benefit our communities. That took a little longer than I anticipated, so sorry for being so long-winded. Yeah, that's great. Do you see a future? I mean, is there another uh, iteration for this uh, project, for this campaign? Yeah, I see. That's part of the visit here. So um, there was a conference that I was out here for, for the super exciting world of public pensions and public finance. But I'm taking advantage of it, um, of being back in Silicon Valley and talking with um, the folks in Palo Alto and then a couple of VC firms to lay the foundation to say, look, we actually need investors to come in and be able to support this, uh, this effort that's across multiple cities. Um, there's a, a grant application, too, that's been submitted by the Vanderbilt um, Computer Science Department to create something where I've never met another entity that likes acronyms as much as government, except for Vanderbilt. <laughs> and the acronym would be called POISE. It's called POISE. And would, if we receive the grant, it's to create an online platform for any city with any problem, um, the associated kind of data that they've pushed out in a structured format, and then that ability to pay that's um, that $5,000 or something that's below their competitive procurement so they don't have to have a developer go through that competitive process. So if that comes through, which we'll find out um, either July or August, um, we'll really have a lot of exciting stuff to continue pursuing. Um, but in the meantime, I'm also trying to hit up some foundations to see if they can help us out, bring cities together. I, I kind of don't want to staff the effort anymore because it's a pain to set up phone calls with across four time zones. <laughs> well, thanks, Yahweh. That's uh, great information. Um, I don't know if there's any. W are you willing to take questions? Do you have time? I do. Yeah, I'm, I, I, I do. I got like 15 minutes. Yeah, let me let me see if there's anybody here that has questions. Chris does. Yeah, I, I do have one. Uh, I heard not long ago that uh, it hadn't been decided yet uh, whether the uh, Bluetooth. Uh, devices were going to be installed in the Music City, I'm sorry, Music City Center. Uh, has that been decided? 
So the, the, the IT team in Music City Center is completely open to installing the, the, um, the Beacon devices. Um, they're thinking about whether or not they should start off with kind of a, a smaller footprint rather than full scale uh, kind of deployment, then picking a wing or two wings to actually roll it out in. Um, and so actually what we're trying to figure out is can we run multiple projects if that's the case, where you actually get some beacons into um, the Music City Center. So they, they're open to it. I mean, it's a brand new facility. They've got a great IT team there. They're, they're completely open to partnering. So if you all have ideas, um, really just know that the MCC team is a great partner to, to try things out with. Okay, thanks. Anyone else? I, mean, I know, um, sorry, a quick follow-up to that, too. There are 50, it's specifically 50 beacons that they're going to roll out in a kind of smaller scale trial. So I think that they're going to try to set it up and stick it behind some of the placards that are on the wall behind the public art so that it's kind of hidden but then still available. I'm just interested in what other kind of projects um, you're involved with. I know this is a new position, so what other kind of things Nashville is doing to become more competitive in technology and um, kind of expand in that room. Yeah, absolutely. I, I think that um, uh, I think that for um, Nashville, there's there's some parts that are like infrastructure related, and it, it's as much you know. One thing that I found fascinating within Kansas City were these hacker houses, where they there were neighborhoods that had been hooked up to um, the Google Fiber network. And it was all co-working space, but in, in residential areas. And so it's like co-working spaces that are popping up in our commercial areas, but completely within neighborhoods. Um, and so that's, you know, to, to get to something like that, we as government have to start at this point to think through, well, what's the code that's involved? And so we have some, some stuff that's going on internally that really will benefit from the developer community's input and knowing if that's something that is potentially um, appealing to the developer community to then say, yeah, if uh, Nashville, whether or not it gets Google Fiber, if there's the prospect of using the NES network um, at some level in the residential space, and we'd love to see hacker houses, then that, that would be really helpful to know. Because um, ultimately, um, honestly, the, the first adopters of something like a fiber network will be you all you know, within the community. And you're going to be kind of determining the use cases and helping to define it. Um, some of what Google Fiber, for example, said that they would be really curious in seeing within Nashville, given its uh, some of its strengths, um, ge uh, home-based geriatric care over fiber network. Um, they also said that they loved to, to understand what would happen with um, you know even greater uh, speeds. What would that mean for uh, musicians? that are doing like basement studios and real-time collaboration um, and you know clearly like uploading uh, recorded music that's being recorded on, um, on a real-time basis. Um, and so that, that's the kind of thing where uh, you know you all would build the technology that would enable the musicians to do something like that. <laughs> um, and, and you know knowing if that's something that is potentially of interest to you um, would be helpful and other ideas that the Google team hasn't mentioned explicitly that you all have. Um, I think uh, more broadly, um, what we're doing internally, the mayor signed an open data executive order. Um, and what we believe now and the culture that we're trying to build within Metro government is that developers are hungry for data. Uh, and I think that, you know, I shared with you in the past the open data portal. So uh, the internal support team that we have for that open data portal is a data professionals network where essentially all of the data geeks within metro departments are coming together in this network now to talk on a, a monthly basis to then say can we define problems from you know a department's perspective make sure that the data the structured data is available that's related to it and publish it on the open data portal and then be able to go to the community and say Hey, you know, here's this problem. Is there any way we can partner around this? Um, if so, it would be, you know, awesome because the community will benefit from it. Um, so the portal is live. Uh, if you haven't seen it, it's data.nashville.gov. Um, 
the Data Professionals Network, our first meeting is going to be uh, the second week of July. Um, and then we're just going to continue to have uh, meetings going forward on a monthly basis. And so um, that data.nashville.gov is going to be the portal that will push out a lot of the uh, opportunities to partner with uh, Metro government. Um, and then you know, going back to the start, the whole time we're going to be trying to work on that additional layer of multiple cities. Because a lot of cities have pushed out this, this open data portal now. And um, you know, if you haven't tried it, uh, it's, it's hosted by this company called Socrata. They, um, they enable, they, they provide a link, so it's basically an API access endpoint um, where you can just grab it, drop it into your code, and then you're able to just pull the data um, on a real-time basis. So anytime we update it on our end, it'll automatically um, benefit, you know, if you build an app around it, it'll benefit your app. Are there any credentials necessary to use that, that API? None. It's all open. So, I mean, data sets, so we, since the National Day of Civic Hacking, we've published a city cemetery data set. <laughs> um, it's basically all of the historic, uh, you know, anyone that you want to know that's buried in any of our historic cemeteries, there's not a ton of information on it. It's, it's an awesome data set. Um, so the, the ideas that we were talking about internally was, you know how New Orleans has those ghost tours of the cemeteries? Um, essentially, there's data now to help create that for, for Nashville if we want to do it. So what's to determine what is uh, civic data and what's not? I mean, like you said, the, you might uh, have all the, the names of all the residents of cemeteries, but let's say what if somebody gave you data that was questionably civic? Would you accept it, or what's the vetting process? Uh, there, these, there are certain designated, I'm still learning about it, there, we have 50 plus departments, and so that's why we wanted to convene all of them in this one group. I'm learning about the historical commission and understanding you know, what they were pulling, but my understanding is that there are certain cemeteries that are designated as historic cemeteries, and you have to have a certain background to be able to be buried in these historic cemeteries. So I don't think it's, um, I think there's a process already of vetting who, who, who ends up in the cemeteries. Um, so, I mean, more broadly, though, if someone is trying to, uh, you know, submit data, it really would be more through an app like Enabled City, right, where it's crowdsourced data that's being generated by people measuring widths of doors and heights of counters, taking photos of, you know, front doors if there's a ramp there. Um, and ultimately, that's, you know, not dissimilar from ways um, you know, you're going to have the people in ways that are going to be uh, scrubbing what's getting posted or, you know, finding ways to vet it, um, not the city. Because, you know, from a city's perspective, from metro government's perspective, once we've published it, the public will do whatever it's going to do with it. And if we publish data, it's actually data that's just coming from our departments directly. It's not data that's coming from the public that we're then republishing for them, if that makes sense. Yes. Can you hear? Um, I wasn't able to hear actually. Sorry. There was an effort to build an app to track uh, MTA buses live uh, location data. I don't know if you know if you have any updates about that. Yeah. Uh, so MTA uh, has signed on uh, signed a contract with a new company. Um, I think the last update that I provided to the group was that they, in the 2011 floods, um, it hit the storage area for the buses and damaged the hardware. So all the tracking devices that were on the buses were um, no longer reliable. So MTA earlier this year signed a contract where the company essentially has to replace all of the uh, tracking devices on the buses. So we're still looking at, you know, when we talk class, it's probably like three months. So I would, and at that point it was a year out. I would say it's nine months out now still. Um, it's, it's a ways away, uh, which is unfortunate, because I know that that would be an awesome addition and use of uh, real-time open data. But, but the, con the contract was explicitly to, cor to provide a, um, the Google format, is it GTSF, um, for the transit format, uh, the transit data that's formatted for Google specifically. 
um, the contractor is required to um, provide uh, an API that um, makes that data available. And so what we can do is publish that on the data.national.gov as soon as it goes live. I think what we're trying to do is figure out if we can start small, and if they, for example, retrofit the downtown buses with the tracking devices, then we're asking if they can push out the data just for the downtown buses first, and then kind of do, on a do it on a phase basis so we can get going sooner rather than later. Awesome. Any more questions? Well, uh, I think that's all we have for you, Yahweh. We really appreciate your, your time, and uh, we're glad you could uh, give your input to this group. Um, I think that's all, so uh, if you're uh, okay, and then I guess, I guess we'll just let you go. All right, thanks so much, everyone. Thanks for hanging out. Thanks. All right. Yahweh, ladies and gentlemen.